Something you and I have talked about plenty and we've probably said on the podcast and I've said ad nauseum to, to indies is like what we see the, the music industry at large spend a lot of its time focusing on really is like top of funnel things just, you know, Oh, we want exposure. We want exposure. We want exposure. Jump from platform to platform based on organic reach and, you know, spend tons of money on uh, top of funnel advertising. And, you know, that has its place, but there's largely a big missing piece in like middle of funnel and bottom of funnel structure. And I think the shiny object syndrome around TikTok is just another example of uh that kind of like narrow mindedness about where marketing matters. You are now listening to the Creative Juice podcast brought to you by Indopreneur.io. What's up, Indies? Welcome back to the Creative Juice podcast. My name is Corinne Campbell. I am your co host. With me is Jack McCarthy. How are you doing, Jack? Doing great. How are you today? Really great. There was uh, happy to have you back. Yeah, it was such a cool conversation last week. I was bummed that I couldn't make it. I've been spending a lot of time on Clubhouse and so many of the rooms are about licensing and publishing and streaming. And it's just uh, my brain was burnt. My brain was totally burnt. So I figured you guys would do just the best possible job of having that discussion. So, we had a good time. <laughs> yeah, it was a good time. Mark dropped Mark dropped a lot of knowledge. It was great. Yeah, I heard, well, I heard, you know, I heard it was a good time. It was not a time that I had, but that's okay. <laughs> so, um, but yeah, it got me raring to go. And, you know, I have been, as I said, spending a lot of time on Clubhouse. And it's been amazing to talk with a lot of different people at a lot of different levels about a lot of different topics, um, obviously most especially the music industry, um, but something that is kind of trending on Clubhouse for me is this this distraction um, of shiny object syndrome, right? Because as mm, we come- My favorite. Yeah, yeah. It, do you wanna define, I don't even know if I've heard that elsewhere. Is that something that you coined or did you pick that up somewhere? Can you explain what it is? No, I, I don't. I don't think that I. Def, I don't think that I coined it. Uh, I would love to take credit for that. It's just something I guess that I picked up along along the way of life. <laughs> um, <laughs> man, I would love to take credit for it. But shiny object syndrome, simply defined, I guess, is uh, is getting distracted by new and shiny things in you know whatever your field might be. Uh, but I use it often when talking about marketing and particularly digital marketing, music marketing, and. Uh, that is what I'm referring to when I talk about shiny object syndrome is uh, getting distracted by, you know, the new thing, the, the new kid on the block and trying to, uh, you know, game the algorithm in the new place or, uh, or the gold rush that might exist on a new social platform that's popping up. And uh, I call it shiny object syndrome because often when it strikes, you uh, tend to neglect the things that are going well for you in hopes that, you know, something else is going to maybe be better. Right. Right. And it, it's, it's so, sometimes it's very funny to watch because I'll see someone pouring just days and weeks and months and years of, of something into, you know, what they're focusing on right now. And then there's this other shiny thing. And part of it is that they're burnt out on the thing that they were working on. And then the other part of it, and so they like want that relief, right? Like, oh man, this was so much work. I just, I want to do something else, <laughs> you know? And so there's a shiny object totally. over in the corner to, <laughs> to kind of distract them from that. Um, but, you know, I think too, it's, it, 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 the music industry is really tough in that way, um, especially for indies, right? Because we're trying to look at these trends, like basically simulate the trajectory of an artist that we respect or something that we've seen them do. Um, and I think sometimes that can be, you know, first off, not realistic because you may not have the management, the label, the resources that that artist does, or even if they are independent, you know, perhaps the way that they create that content for that platform isn't necessarily something that would fit on your brand. And when you try to yeah. fit yourself, your, your square peg into a round hole, so to speak, like it ends up feeling very, uh, you know, inauthentic, you know, it doesn't really sound like you anymore. And I think it's really important that as artists, we kind of have that, 
you know, definition of who we are and how we talk to people. And, um, you know, I, I, it saddens me when I see people get distracted and their brand kind of gets desegmented in that way, you know? Yeah, absolutely. You know, that's an interesting, that's an interesting kind of, uh, additional angle to shiny object syndrome. I think it's something we've talked about previously when it comes to things like, you know, launching a record, for example, or releasing music, we, you know, when it comes to imitating other artists, especially like bigger artists, you know, I've had plenty of conversations over the years where people say like, oh, well, like I just want to do, you know, what uh, I'm going to just pull a name out of thin air. Like I'm going to just do what Taylor Swift did and just drop my album out of nowhere. Or I'm going to do what Beyonce did and just, you know, just drop my album out of nowhere. And it's like, you don't have the, the ecosystem to support a choice like that. Um, obviously that's not shiny object syndrome, but in a way it kind of is. It's like, Oh, I'm seeing how everyone else is doing things. And even though, you know, their method may not apply to me based on where I'm at, um, I'm going to try to do it anyway. And oftentimes it just falls flat on its face. So the same can be said for, you know, brand, uh, or platform shiny object syndrome. Right. Yeah. It's tough, right? Because, all throughout our human existence, right? Like there's inspiration. Like even as we're learning to create music, we're probably listening to other musicians so that we can kind of see what that process looks like or to simulate something that we want to happen, right? Um, when we're learning to talk, we're surrounded by people who are talking and we're listening to them and then talking back and getting better at it, you know? Um, and it's really, I think there's a really difficult uh, differentiation between, you know, being inspired by someone, um, and trying to simulate something that doesn't work for you. You know, I, I get yeah. frustrated all the time because I have conversations with, you know, industry people or with indies, you know, really people in the music business of all levels. And it's like, I can't look at Ariana Grande and decide what to do with my career based on anything that's happened in hers right? Like yeah, she was a preach. kid, she was on Nickelodeon or whatever it was. And, you know, she's got, she's basically had Scooter Braun as her manager for, you know, most of her career, like, and is on obviously like a major label. And, you know, this is one of the highest streamed artists in, in the world. But like, even when she started, it's so alien to any existence I've had, you know? And so if her team is like, oh, well, we really put a lot of priority on streaming, it's, it, you know, you feel the tendency to want to be like, oh, well, that's what's important then, you know, because that artist is, is doing that. And therefore, you know, she is the epitome of a successful commercial artist. So I should also be doing that, you know? Yeah. And, yeah. you know, so I have a question for you because obviously at IndieX, you work with artists of all levels and, you know, brands and, and creators of all levels. Um, from small audiences to mid-sized to large, right? So, you know, how do you figure that out when you're trying to look at the inspiration that these people should be taking and, you know, where they can be influenced or inspired by something and where maybe it's off track based on who they are, where they are, what their team is compiled of, et cetera? For sure. So that's a great question. And I mean, this, I, I'm probably going to say something here that won't apply to most indies <laughs> because it's really just like in the process of how we run IndieX as an agency is, you know, we're very goal focused. So if somebody is having a consultation with me and we're trying to determine if working together is a right fit, if they have goals that are just supremely out of reach based on where they're at because of some aspiration based on another artist or another team or whatever it might be. Well, in a, I mean, frankly, like I have to be honest with them about that. Um, yeah. that's really, imp that's a really important part to like giving people the right recommendations. So I often do come across saying things that, you know, sometimes can rub people the wrong way. I'm also very, you know, very polite about it, <laughs> but you have to be candid with people to be like, okay, I understand, you know, at the core of what you're saying, why you might think that that's the right thing for you to do or why you might want to do that or why it might seem appealing. But I think it's going to lead you down a path that actually doesn't result in what you're looking to do. Right. Um, so that's one conversation that often happens even before we're working with folks. Um, but in terms of like, you know, the day to day of working with artists on their strategies is uh, when people are, you know, getting inspiration 
uh, from all sorts of places, whether that be podcast or YouTube or watching other artists, you know, it, it comes from anywhere. Clubhouse uh, <laughs> could be anything. Um, I think I always like to bring people back to a place of like, what is that going to do for your overall ecosystem? What is that going to do for, you know, your, uh, your fan base for the growth that you know you need to be making right now? Um, based on, you know, data that you have available to you, where does anything that might be, uh, kind of piquing your curiosity, where does it fit into your growth as a, as an artist and as a business? That's kind of like the first question that I ask. Cause if somebody can't answer that, well, then they need to step back and, and ask themselves that question and seek to answer it. Um, that's kind of the starting point. And then it's, you know, a matter of once we start digging into, you know, where that could have a positive effect, if that could have a positive effect, um, then, you know, you start to dive into like, okay, well, like what kind of strategies can we actually employ that might do something similar for you, but maybe would be less arduous or, uh, get you where you're trying to go through a path that might make more sense to you. You know what I mean? Yeah, totally. I mean, I've seen, I've been privy to the NDX applications that you get. And, you know, I, it's funny just looking at it from a, a practical point of view, I mean, sometimes people will put in an application for our agency, NDX, and there'll be goals. It'll be like, what are your goals? What are your three top business goals? Um, and do you put a timeline on that, Jack? Is it like a year or do you just say think, three in general? I think it's three over, I believe the application is three within the next year. Like what okay. are your top business goals this year? Right. And so the number of <laughs> of applications that come in with like, make a billion streams on Spotify or, you know, sell mm -hmm. out the O2. It's kind of like, whoa, wait a second, bro. Like that, there are so many objectives between where you are right now and that objective. Um, and so it's not even that it's not realistic for the next year. It's that if you can't even like itemize the things that are your objectives between where you are and there, right? We And we've talked about this prior um, to this conversation where it's like, look, you've got these goals and you're shooting for the stars, hit the moon. Whereas, you know, and that's one phrase, but I like to look at it more as if I'm shooting for the moon and I'm doing things to get to the moon. And then from the moon, I go to Mars and then I know what that looks like. And then from Mars, I go to the next place. And eventually, right. you know, I know those stars are out there, but I'm not shooting for them. I'm shooting for the next step. In fact, I actually, I was having a conversation with a friend of mine um, and he was talking about, you know, dreams and like bringing them into reality. And he's like, what are, what's your biggest dream as an artist? Like what, what's the, you know, where you, that happens and you're like, all right, cool. I made it. And I could, I couldn't, I couldn't think of it because I, I don't think like that. You know, I think about what's yeah. the next thing I need to do and what are all the cool things that could fall out from that? Well, there's a ton, you know? But so, well, and what are all the cool things that could happen along the way of that? Right. You know, what is the what is the process? Why is the process of getting to where you want to be next cool? Right, right. And so, by having this kind of like stricter, rigorous look at my objectives as a musician and the things that I want to accomplish, it kind of takes me out of that shiny object business, right? And and that I, I view that fortunately, I'm just kind of wired that way. I'm lucky. It's definitely not something I'm like mega skilled at or <laughs> that I should get any credit for. It's just kind of how my brain is wired. And so that worked out well for me. But I think there are times, you know, where artists on purpose need to be like, look, all those dreams are super tight. That's dope. I'm going to do that. Right. But also there are these steps along the way that I, I need to focus on those because if all I'm doing is shooting as high as I possibly can, I'm not going to get this other stuff done. Right. And that really deters me from shiny objects. So, I mean, obviously, you know, there's a lot of, I, there are topics that I've heard on Clubhouse like crazy. One of them being um, AI in music, right? Which mm, there's, yeah. that exists and there are some things, but there's also a ton of futuristic kind of focus to that. There's NFTs and blockchain, right? Everybody's looking at those things that are, it's not that they're that far, but they're far. You know, yeah. they're not things that you can do en masse right now. The consumer's not crazy wanting, you know, NFT blockchain kind of technology. Yeah. The other thing is, you know, TikTok. 
Yep. <laughs> you know? And so I'm interested from your perspective, what are some of the shiny objects that, you know, some people are getting focused on? And it could be something small. It could be something large, you know? Um, what are the things that you think that are things that you could do right now, but are still considered shiny? So here's a couple that come to mind. Uh, I'll pick on the, I'll pick on two obvious ones to start and we'll just see where this goes. Um, the first one certainly has been live streaming right in, in the past year, uh, that has become a shiny object for a lot of people, largely by necessity because touring hasn't been a thing. Live shows haven't been a thing. So a lot of folks have been trying to figure out how to do live streaming. And I call it shiny because for a lot of people who are all of a sudden like, you know, crowding their way into the door of live streaming for the first time, they're doing it for the first time. So for those people, it's a shiny thing that it's, it's a practical shiny thing that, you know, right now you need to be getting in. And I think I've mentioned this on previous episodes. Um, and even in our, uh, even in our 2020 wrap up episode with predictions for this year, uh, we talked about how, you know, live streaming is going to become more saturated. And one of the things that I felt and have definitely seen in Indie X with a lot of our clients and with a lot of artists in general is if you weren't live streaming before 2020 happened, and now you're trying to like shoehorn your way in, like you better be damn good and putting a really great product out. Cause if anything is mediocre, like you're just going to be static as this gets more and more, uh, saturated. So live mm -hmm. streaming, live streaming has become shiny object in a lot of ways that people think they can just do the bare minimum with it, but that couldn't be further from the truth. Like if you want to be successful with live streaming right now, you need to really be thinking outside the box. You need to really be determining what your audience digs about your specific brand, about your live stream, about your music, really knowing your customer. Honestly, that's what it is. Knowing your customer and knowing how to create an, an offer for them uh, around a live stream uh, that makes sense and that you know, appeals to them. and isn't just like, I'm going to live stream because everybody else is doing it. Um, I think that that's kind of been shiny object number one, uh, that comes to my mind. Yeah, totally. And it's like you said, right. There are actions that are shiny, right. Which could be yep. implemented on many different platforms. And then there's platforms themselves or tools themselves that are shiny. Yep. Right. Yep. I know in the entrepreneur Facebook group, I see stuff like that all the time. It's like, what's everybody think about this? You know? Yeah. And it's yeah. usually something that's, you know, similar to something else that we were already doing, but it's like got something, you know, it's got gilded, you know, a gilded frame around it or whatever, you know? Um, and so that's something to be considered, right? Like, Say that you're using a tool, um, even if it's just like a filtering app for your Instagram, I guess that's less involved. So you're using a email provider, right? And you see this other one that's shiny, right? If you are looking to pivot to something that you feel is shinier or serves your purposes better, like where, where do you make that call? Like, is it shiny or is it something that's productive? You know, is there a, a set kind of blanket standards that you have when you're considering something like that? Yeah, I think it kind of, I think it kind of depends like shiny thing to shiny thing, you know, um, for a, a, like, let's pick on email marketing for a second here. Like when it comes to that sort of thing, I often, and I've had, we've done plenty of email marketing migrations for, for artists at Indie X. Um, and it's a process, right? So like, there's a lot that goes into it for everyone involved, not just for like the, the, the digital team that's on it. The artist has a lot of involvement in it. There's a lot of brand elements that needs to transfer over and, and really be carried over correctly. Um, so it's not just pure tech. Um, and I think, you know, that's, that's an, that's a, an example of like a, a shiny object or it could be shiny object that it's like, okay, if you're considering a transition over to something else or a refocusing towards a different platform, you know, can you name three things about this that it will immediately impact for you based on what you're doing? You know, whether it be uh, better data aggregation, whether it be the ability to, you know, segment differently, um, or are you just doing it because everybody else is talking about it? I think that's kind of the 
uh, that's kind of the approach that I take is like, okay, well, like if we're going to speak about this, <laughs> then why are we talking about it? You know, how, what impact is it immediately going to have on you? What would that transition do for you in the right now? And then what would it do for you in a future state? You know, uh, let's say, you know, you, you're looking to migrate over and you know, I've got, you know, 2000 customers and that's great. And I know that it will have like a few immediate impacts on me, uh, for those people, but what would it do in a year's time? Uh, kind of work to predict a little bit. I think those are kind of the two approaches that I take with it. Um, and that we take at the agency, uh, cause a lot of stuff like that comes through. I mean, you wouldn't believe how many times, uh, uh, an email marketing migration has occurred. And then, you know, two weeks later, an artist has said like, actually, I don't really like this. Like, let's go back to the thing that we were doing before. And that sucks. It's just a waste of time. Um, I hate, I hate, I hate for people when that happens to them. Cause it's like, oh, you just burned like, you know, a bunch of your time doing something that you decided you didn't actually like. And it's trial and error. I get it. But um, yeah, that's my approach. <laughs> got it. Got it. Yeah. I mean, that's something I've, and I even may be over resistant to shiny object syndrome in that, you know, I, uh, I don't know. I just, I feel like there's so much pressure on me as a musician to like be in so many places and do so many things um, right. and be so many things, right. To combine the two. Yeah. So many hats. Um, right. And so in my mind, there's like categorical um, ways for me to kind of discern this stuff, right? Like I don't love doing little dances. And so when TikTok first started to come back, like when Musical.ly moved over to TikTok, right? And TikTok became the thing that it is becoming now. I was like, well, everybody's doing little dances and I don't want to do little dances. So I'm not, I'm not going to do it. <laughs> you yeah, know? Yep. But now there's content on there that is not dancing, which is tight, you know? But um, it still is, you know, highly dependent on posting a lot which I also don't like to do. I like to gate yeah. more of my content and not necessarily be cranking something out for breakfast, lunch, and dinner, you know? Yeah. Um, so, and I'm like, okay, well, what does TikTok serve outside of being this viral, crazy discovery platform, right? Like, is it serving, it's basically content consumption, you know? Yeah. And I wish that artists got more distracted by things that weren't all doing the same thing. Right. And this comes back to objective, right? If you're posting stuff on Facebook and IG and Snapchat and Twitter and, you know, TikTok, and maybe you're like repurposing content, you know, so much of TikTok content is being repurposed into IG reels now, um, which Instagram has, you know, very openly said that if you're posting things with the TikTok logo in it, it's going to hurt you in your reach and you're probably not going to show up on Discover at all. Um, so it's, it's like, if I'm just like adding another platform, but I'm using the same content, it, to me, it doesn't make sense. You know, um, I'd yep. be interested in what you think about that because there's a, it's difficult because I feel for artists and that they have to do so many things and create so much content to then be like, look, you need to create native content on every platform or not do it at all. Right. Like I yeah. want people to be able to repurpose things. I want as a musician to repurpose things, but there's also a point where it doesn't make sense, you know? So where is that line as far as you're concerned? Yeah. I mean, TikTok was the next one that I was going to talk about as shiny objects. So I'm glad you went there. Of course. Um, cause it, cause it is, <laughs> it's, it's the big shiny object for, uh, for a lot of folks right now. And I don't want to bash on TikTok, right? Like I've probably done enough of that. <laughs> um, but it's tough because and something you and I have talked about plenty and we've probably said on the podcast and I've said ad nauseum to, to indies is like what we see the, the music industry at large spend a lot of its time focusing on really is like top of funnel things just, you know, Oh, we want exposure. We want exposure. We want exposure. Jump from platform to platform based on organic reach and, you know, spend tons of money on, uh, top of funnel advertising. And, you know, that has its place, but there's largely a big missing piece in like middle of funnel and bottom of funnel structure. And I think the shiny object syndrome around TikTok is just another example of uh, that kind of like narrow mindedness about where marketing matters. And, and 
we talked about this on our on our episode about Madison Ave marketing versus direct response. Um, it's kind of the same pattern that we're seeing, you know. Um, I think that's kind of where some of the pressure around TikTok comes from. That's why you hear people say like, oh, don't sleep on TikTok. And I'm not saying to sleep on TikTok. Uh, my recommendation That would be been very to, not exciting if you yeah. posted something of yourself sleeping on TikTok. Yeah. I don't think it would do well. <laughs> hey, you never know. You never know. I talk in my you know, sleep from time to time. That could be quality <laughs> content. <laughs> Yeah, totally. I'm sorry. Continue. <laughs> um, but I think, you know, my recommendation for a lot of people when TikTok has come up in conversation has been like, well, for one, like, how much are you creating content right now to begin with? Like, if you're not creating content for your other channels and like all of a sudden you think because TikTok is there, it's going to motivate you to create content. Well, I would challenge you on that and say, probably not likely that like a platform is going to change your content creation habits. That to me says that you're just hoping that a platform is going to solve all your problems, which it's not, you know, um, unless you're very, very lucky. Um, so that's like one, one sort of dig that I make. It's like, well, you're not really posting much anywhere else. Like why would TikTok be any different for you? Like, yeah, I might sound like a jerk, but like, <laughs> that's a, that's a question that I, that's a soul searching question that I think people need to ask themselves, um, for one. But I also, I also say, as far as a recommendation goes, is like, if you're interested in the kind of content that, uh, you know, is native to TikTok and you feel like it fits within your brand. And maybe this is where we start to get into like really focusing down on what your brand is and where, con where your content falls into that. Well, then start exploring it, but don't put all your eggs in that basket and neglect what you what you have found to be working. Um, that was something that we spoke about on Clubhouse with an indie who you know was interested in TikTok, but uh, she and her artists were having a lot of success already on YouTube Live and on Facebook Live and doing IG. And it was like, okay, that's great. Like, if you want to try it, by all means, like get in there and play with it and have fun with it, but don't neglect what's been working for you. Um, when TikTok really started to get popular and uh, kind of be the talk of the town, Digital Marketer posted a meme on their Instagram that was like, uh, it was just hilarious. It was, it was one of the standard kind of memes that was going around at the time. And it was talking about exactly that, like not ignoring the channels that are working for you in favor of, you know, the gold rush to a new one. So yeah, anyway, um, that's a lot of what my recommendation has been is just like, well, if you think you're interested in that, then get into it, but don't expect it to become a miracle worker for you overnight. Don't expect it to be a viral machine for you. That's, you know, that takes time and dedication. So that's going to take the same amount of time and dedication that you might be putting elsewhere. Um, and it also depends on the kind of content that you create, um, which could bring us down a whole rabbit hole of like, how do you determine the type of content that you should be creating as an artist? You know? Absolutely. I think, yeah, Clubhouse just informs so much of my, or it, it's so much of my thinking process yeah. now because yeah, I'm on same. it like 18 hours a day every day, <laughs> you know, but I go into, you know, a lot of rooms with indie musicians and something that I, I hear all the time. Um, and it's just something that never processed in my mind, but there are goals, right? Like when we're talking about what are you doing and what's your objective, there are goals like through streaming and through TikTok and, you know, through some of these channels where it's like their goal is to get the attention of someone with significant influence, you know, um, and, yeah. and that's the goal. And part of me is like, well, they're doing something that, you know, could potentially serve that objective, but, you know, it just seems so pie in the sky to me. Um, and so, you know, I'm interested, I mean, obviously at Entrepreneur and on this podcast, we're very, very focused on, you know, building our fan base and giving them opportunities to dig deeper. Um, and so, you know, where does that objective, 
I'm, I'm trying to be objective about it, right? Objective in two ways. In objective one about objectives. I'm trying to be objective about objectives. And even if I'm not looking to grab the attention of some random, you know, manager or label or, you know, some other service as an artist, right? Like, where does that fit in the scope of things? And because I feel like you could pursue both, right? I mean, I'm not pursuing that at all. But I'm sure there are artists who listen to our podcast who are like, look, I can do both. You know, I can I can focus my efforts in a way where I am potentially reaching people through this, uh, you know, this goal of virality. But I'm also doing other things. And so what does that combination look like to you? Maybe this is just me being old school about it or you know, old fashioned. But I think, you know, if your goal is to if one of your objectives is to be noticed or, you know, have clout amongst, you know, gatekeepers, so to speak, whether that be managers or A&R, label people, uh, whatever it might be, I think what's going to make you stand out is consistency in whatever it is you're doing. So if that means being on TikTok and making that kind of content, being consistent about it is going to, you know, show off your work ethic. And as a, as an artist that's in business, that's critical. You know, that's way more critical than just like a one-time viral thing. Like plenty of people go viral all the time and then they just drop off because there's no real work ethic or uh, consistency behind it. It's just a flash in the pan luck moment. Um, I think that that's, that's kind of where the where the sauce is for me, at least is like, if you're, if that's part of your objective, then wherever you're channeling that energy, whatever platform it might be, being consistent there is going to be the thing that gets you paid attention to, or at least talked about beyond just like a, Oh, they're blowing up on that thing. And it's just kind of like a passing comment. Right. Yeah. And in theory, you know, even if you start diving in that that's where the shininess comes in right like because shiny things you know you got to keep them polished they don't just stay shiny so even if you are like okay I'm gonna go chase and I, I know we keep using TikTok as an example but there are so many things this could be <laughs> yeah right? not trying to pick not trying to pick on TikTok but yeah. yeah exactly um but if you are you know chasing a shiny object you have to like you know test it out and if you feel like you're getting any traction or you feel like it's something you enjoy, you got to stick with it, right? Because no matter if you're talking about fans, if you're talking about, you know, industry execs and stuff like that, there has to be a kind of a record of this, right? Like one video, I don't think I've heard about any one video being what led to something, right? Like maybe one video is what got someone's attention, but then they're going to be sitting there and watching. And I think the same is true of fans. You know, the 502s uh, with Ed Isola, who is an agency account manager for us, um, you know, he had one video randomly go viral. And, you know, he did say that as they continued to pump content into that platform, you know, he saw the numbers go back down and that, but he's still consistently, you know, making the effort, which is something in and of itself. And if he can get another video to do that well, then perhaps there's a trend to be noted there. But I, I do think that whether you're talking about, you know, streams or social or any of this forward facing vanity metric kind of stuff, you can't get too distracted to then be like, well, that didn't work. So I'm going to go try this other thing. Right. <laughs> like totally. that's, that's where you kind of shoot yourself in the foot because you, even if you have one moment of success on something that alone is not going to be enough. And so I think that's actually something where it overlaps, where if you're looking for industry attention or if you're looking for fan attention, you know, you have to be consistent. And unless you want to be consistent at 25 things and neglect, you know, some, um, some deeper parts of your funnel as an artist, like you just, you're, you're going to spread yourself too thin, you know? Yeah. And you're going to chase your tail. Like that's kind of what I envision it as. It's like, where you're chasing, depending if you decide to switch context totally, like you're, you grew a new tail and you're chasing that tail and forgetting about the other one, you know? Oh my gosh, multiple tails. Yeah. That sounds like fun. 
<laughs> but yeah, yeah, I get what you're saying. Totally. So yeah, I mean, let's, okay, so let's dial it back, right? If we're talking about shiny object syndrome and brand voice, right? What do you think is a good way for an artist to assess their own brand voice and then make those decisions about what shiny objects they should try, right? Because trying shiny objects shouldn't be based on an external influence of like, oh, I saw this dude, he did something super dope and it went viral and I want to do that, right? If they aren't something that, where it's not something that would resonate with your people or resonate with you as an artist, So where, you know, what kind of factors are you looking at if you are, you know, deciding whether an artist goes and tries a new thing? Yeah. So I think a couple things kind of on this front is like one, like just knowing your brand voice and knowing your customer or knowing your brand is kind of step one in this because, you know, you wouldn't believe how many people don't really think about that portion. (laughs) Right. Um, really don't know like who they are as an artist. So I think like one thing to really sit down with is like looking at yourself as a musician, as a songwriter, as a band, whatever, whatever you are. Um, and kind of figuring out like, who am I, you know, asking that question, like what are the things that interest me that I want to share with my people? Yeah. Who am I though? (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Seriously though. So I think like, taking an exercise like that and really just kind of going like going into topics and figuring out, you know, like what are the kinds of things that I want to be sharing beyond just like my music? What are the stories behind the music? What, you know, do I like something about the creation process process of music that I want to be, you know, have that tied into my brand? Maybe you're like, uh, maybe you spend a lot of time in studios and, and that's kind of your thing. Um, maybe you don't, maybe you don't spend a lot of time in studios. Maybe you write your songs on a, I don't know, like a park bench, uh, ritually at seven o'clock on Tuesday nights. And that's something, you know, p- that becomes part of your story. I think determining kind of those topics that surround you. Um, and I'm, t- I'm kind of taking a nod here from Dennis Yu from Blitzmetrics, who talks about this idea of a topic wheel, uh, determining the things, uh, and this isn't this isn't really just about music or musicians. Uh, it can apply to really any kind of brand, but it's determining what are the things that orbit you from a topical perspective that then you can you know imbue into your content. I think that that's kind of starting point number one when figuring that this out is like really identifying like what about your brand you want to be sharing or, or what makes up your brand. And then from there, uh, looking at those topics and determining like, okay, based on these things, how do they fit into the platforms that I'm interested in natively? Do they fit into the platforms that I'm interested in? You know, if I'm interested in, you know, studio sessions and that's something that's near and dear to me as an artist and I feel like uh, it's content that I want to be sharing with my people, then how does that fit into, you know, Facebook Live? How does that fit into the kind of content that's shared on TikTok? And sort of just checking off boxes and seeing if things fit and where they fit. Um, that's the that's the approach that I would take. Yeah, totally. Is there a way that we can research you know, do you think that platforms have kind of their own personality or is there a way to research, you know, what content does well on what, on certain platforms or is there just, you know what I mean? Like, is it like any kind of content can work anywhere if you do it well? You know what I mean? Uh, Yeah. I, I mean, I don't know. I don't have a hard stance really. I think like you can, you can, kind of research and determine what's working on a platform in this moment, you know, this week, this month, but that could change, you know, (laughs) like just like memes change, like content changes all the time. And the type of content that's consumed on a platform changes all the time. So you can, I think you can infer based on what's working, like, and start to get ideas. But at the same time, I think it change, it can change so often and so quickly that it's hard to like, you know, pin down definitively what's going to be working on a, on a platform three months down the line, six months down the line. You know what I mean? I don't know. What do you think? Uh, I think if, just from my point of view, I think that any platform can have like this, this goes back to building out your people. Right. And 
you could, I think you could, you could use any platform, honestly, to attract the people who know you. And in theory, those people exist anywhere that there's a significant user base. So if you are into studio stuff, I don't see any reason why that would fit one platform or another personally. Um, as long as you have the, the, the people who will follow you in the first place, you know what I mean? Um, I, For sure. yeah, it's, it's really difficult to, I think, to make that determination, but it's all, and this is where we go again to looking at people who are doing what you're doing. And typically I try to research artists that are more at my level or are at the next little fraction of a level, right? If I'm like, okay, I'm going to explore this new platform. I want to know what it does. I want to see if it's something that I like and if it's something that can work for me. Um, I, instead of looking at the people who are huge on that platform and being like, okay, I'm going to simulate what they're doing, right? I look for artists that are doing something similar to what I like and maybe aren't huge, right? Because yeah. there's always going to be a variety of users on any given platform. Um, and in theory, you can find them if you kind of know what direction to move in. And if there's a platform that doesn't have, you know, trending, um, trending stuff or even like a mid-level, you know, and I'm not, I'm not talking about virality, but if there's not any content that is the type of content I want to make, I probably wouldn't lean in it too hard. Uh, because yeah. at that point it's like, well, do I want to be the one forging the, you know, the brand new thing <laughs> and hoping yeah. that that's creating a new audience, you know? Um, whereas like if you're into, you know, say you perform a lot. Um, I know one of the artists that we've talked to a lot on Clubhouse is, you know, and his mom is helping with his career because he's a teen, but he's this like prodigal bass player, you know? And he tried TikTok and it didn't do great. You know, um, and I, but I do see a lot of performance video that works on various platforms, um, but it's stronger on these other platforms, right? So right. Yeah. you might not be able to forge a brand new kind of content that isn't doing well um, on a platform. Yeah, it's, I think it's difficult to say. I mean, I think when it really comes down to it, you need to find what content you like within your brand voice and within the way that, the fans who already love you the way they're used to engaging with you, um, maybe finding a creative spin on it so that it's not stale, but not going in a, a totally different direction just because you want to try some other social platform. And it's like we talked about a couple of weeks ago where it's like, look, these are going to be popping up like crazy. All of these developers, I mean, I'm I'm developing a tech startup right now uh, outside of Entrepreneur that's going to be like membership based and serve a lot, you know, kind of answer a lot of problems that I have within my tech stack and a lot of things that I wish could happen. Um, but, you know, when you're talking about social platforms and developing like that is happening rapidly because so many people are sitting at home and thinking about solutions. Uh, the number of live streaming platforms that have popped up in the last you know, six huh. to nine months. Yeah. yeah, it's bonkers. There's just so many and they all offer different feature sets or some of them are really very, very, very similar. Um, so we have to assume, I think, coming out of this phase of, you know, of COVID, which I hope is a phase because <laughs> geez, but um, we're going to see a ton of these pop up. And so I think it's an especially important time for artists to think about that you know, and when these different things pop up, consider like, does this serve my objective? Is there a way that the content that I like making is on here uh, natively and doing well and not get distracted, you know? Spot on. Yeah, I think I, I couldn't agree more. And I think when getting into a new platform and, you know, trying it out, like you said, like you don't want to swerve off the road that you're already on and, and be forced to, you know, find what's perfectly working on that platform. A lot of times I, I would say like, try to find a hybrid of what you're doing and what you're seeing working on, you know, other channels and try to adapt it or even just test it, you know, uh, in the format of the, of the platform that you're trying to, you know, start toying with. Um, I, I think that that's a good kind of middle ground of like ignoring something altogether and, uh, and, you know, distracting yourself or, you know, forcing yourself into a, 
into a corner that you're not really familiar with or a content type that you're not really familiar with. Yeah. And I think the, the last thing I would consider about considering new tools and, you know, obviously we're talking mostly about social stuff on, you know, on this chat, but, um, you know, when you're looking at website builders or email providers or, uh, you know, all of the different things, right. That are coming up in marketing technology, especially in the music marketing space is that, you know, there's development dollars that have to be, you know, put into these platforms. And there's a lot of, you know, alpha sessions, beta sessions where they are building up the users and they're not going to find the bugs or kind of the missing pieces of that product until they get further into it. Um, yeah. Anytime a social platform or if really any platform pops up, I immediately go and claim my username because I'm Corinne Campbell, one word on everything that I'm in, <laughs> you know, um, because I want that, that same handle. I want the same handle as my URL so that I'm very easy to find. It helps with SEO, right? When people are looking for my various platforms. Um, that's why I had a Musical.ly account. And that's why I still have a TikTok account, you know, yeah, is yeah. because I claimed it back in 2015 or 14 or whenever it was. Um, but then I didn't do anything with it, but I at least held it so that then when, if, if it becomes some really recognizable platform, um, I've still got that saved. But yeah, I, I think that there's, you know, that maybe that's a tip right? <laughs> Tips and yeah. tricks and hacks, but, uh, stake your claim, stake yeah, your claim. Exactly. Stake your claim. I cannot remember the name of that app that popped up last year. Um, it started with a V and I, I don't remember, but, um, I have a, I have an account on there and I have a name and I didn't use it, you know, but oh, if it gets, the, there was another app that popped up in like, I want to say 2017 or 2018. Mm -hmm. I can't remember the name of it, but it I was know. another social, it was another social platform. Yep. It, everyone was like, it's going to be the new thing. And now it, it, I don't remember it. <laughs> yeah. There was like a gold rush to it. Um, and yeah. it was, it was very similar to like all these other platforms, but it was, it was in dark mode, which I liked <laughs> yeah, immediately. Yep. Um, and, but yeah, it was just like another channel where they were trying to gather users and they were attempting to simulate, you know, a lot of content distribution that is everywhere else, you know? So um, that's why I'm kind of, I'm working on my own stuff is so that it's like, look, I don't need to go anywhere else. I have a place where people, the my people can go. Um, and yeah. it's, you know, not focusing on discovery because there's plenty of other platforms that do that for me, you know? Totally, yeah, absolutely. And, you know, maybe, maybe if I can if I could sum up like a piece of advice that I would have when it comes to just like focusing down on your brand and not getting distracted is like, don't put faith in the gold rushes. Like that's where you're going to lose because then you're just gambling. You're playing with luck. And rather than focusing in on the stuff that you know is kind of tried and true for you, I'm not saying it has to be tried and true for anybody else, but if you put all your eggs in the gold rush basket, that's where you're going to, lose. So if I can, you know, when it comes to shiny objects, like play with them, sure. But don't put all of your eggs in that basket and don't put faith in the gold rush. Awesome. So thanks so much for joining us this week, Indies. We'll be back next week with a surprise because I don't even know what we're talking about yet, but we're going to talk about something cool. <laughs> so looking forward to seeing you then. And until next week, stay indie.